The spirit of truth, which the world cannot accept, will be with you. I will not leave you orphans, even though I will, uh, the world will soon no longer be able to see me. These are words of farewell from Jesus. And, uh, you know, in a way, they're apocalyptic. They are a message of hope in a time of crisis. That's what, a, that's what apocalyptic means. Message of hope, time of crisis. And as a matter of fact, very little has changed. <laughs> we still need that message of hope. We're still in a time of crisis as far as I'm concerned. And we're still scared. And every once in a while, it does feel like God has abandoned us. But God the Father, Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit are always there when we are truly in need of them. And, you know, in a way, it's like we just need to flip a switch on in our hearts. God does not abandon us, but we always have the power to push him away. And when we do that, the world becomes a dark place. You know, it's, it's a little like being in a room with shuttered windows. The sun still exists. We've just sealed ourselves off from the sunlight. And, you know, when you do that for long enough, you're going to get sick. And if you do that for even longer than that, that sunlight will become painful and harmful, even though it's an inherently good thing. Like, we need sunlight. But if you lose your ability to handle it, it, it almost turns against you, at least until you can reacclimate. I, uh, I read about this creepy experiment a, a while back. Um, the scientists wanted to see what would, uh, what would be discovered about the spiritual universe if someone was completely deprived of all of their senses, like all five of their senses. So they, they happened to find a volunteer for this, an old man. He, he did not have long you know, before his death. And he said, eh, I've got nothing left to live for. I'll do it. So over the course of the experiment, they, they slowly took away all five of his senses. They, they deadened the nerves neurologically somehow. Don't ask me the details. And as this went on, the, the man's words became more and more haunted. He, 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 his personality changed. He talked about the fall of mankind and our sinful nature. And the last thing he said with fear and trepidation, he cries out, I understand now. God has completely abandoned us, and shortly thereafter, he dies. Now, to be brutally honest, I have no idea if this story is true. <laughs> I read it on the internet, <laughs> and I'm a little gullible when it comes to those sorts of things. But if the story is true, I think it's extremely important that we understand that the man was wrong. The man was wrong when he said that God has abandoned us. God does not abandon us ever. And I don't know what he saw or experienced, again, assuming the story is true in the first place. Don't know what he saw, but you have to remember that he had already lost his sense of self-worth. Nobody with any sense of self-worth would ever agree to be part of that horrible experiment. No, that is contradictory. Which means he was already in a fairly godless place before the experiment began. So after it reached its conclusion and he couldn't find God, that is not surprising because God had already been pushed away by him previously. God does not abandon us. He does not leave us orphans. He will not leave us orphans. However, he, he meets us in a spirit of truth. That's what we heard in the gospel. So when we abandon a basic spiritual truth, like our sense of self-worth, for instance, we push God away a little bit more. And when we rediscover that divine truth, we grow closer to God in exactly the same way. And in part, that is what the Holy Spirit is. It's our connection to God in a spirit of truth which we always have the freedom to accept or reject. You know, they say that you can tell what a priest is reading by their homilies. And for me, that's pretty true. A lot of what I have to say comes from a nonfiction book or a fictional book or the music I'm listening to or the movies I'm watching. But not today. This particular message is not coming from a book. It's coming from the people in my life. Some people who somehow have wound up in a godless place. 
you know, they've detached themselves from that spirit of truth. You know, I'm thinking about an older friend, uh, uh, Mouse is her name. Mouse is her nickname. <laughs> Need that on the record. Um, we went to the same college, although I didn't meet her until after I graduated. She was one of the little, like, uh, the, she was in my clique for, uh, for the Madison West Coast Swing Club. So it wasn't just her and me, there was a bunch of us that went to the Madison West Coast Swing Club every Wednesday night for dancing. And I loved it. I loved every Wednesday night there. Um, and, and the thing is, like, I was working third shift at a really not fun job. So I had to go to work immediately after dancing, and I still looked more forward to Wednesdays than the weekends because I enjoyed being with these people so much. But as time went on, Mouse started getting really negative over time. And, and the milestone moment that I remember was during the Recall Walker protests. And she gave, me, she gave us this horrible, horrible Facebook post where she said she now considered herself one of the world's few true atheists because she no longer believed in love in any way, shape, or form, including the love a parent has for their child. <laughs> she couldn't even believe in that. Ugh. And um, everything on Facebook besides that was about how evil Scott Walker was, we need to recall him, yada, yada, yada. Now, don't care about the politics, you can love Scott Walker, you can hate him, don't care, no judgment here. But I want you to imagine how sad my friend was. She had nothing in her life but state-level politics. She didn't even have the belief that her parents genuinely loved her. Whew. That is a godless world to live in, if I have ever heard one. Now, I'll admit that's a, uh, a relatively old memory. I'm also thinking of someone more recently. Uh, she, she's, she's having a rough time of it. And uh, suicide is not terribly far from her thoughts. Um, I don't think she's at high risk or anything like that, but she thinks about it more often than I would consider healthy. And um, she, she said that she's, she's run out of faith somewhere along the line. And she said that she hasn't prayed for two whole years, but the last thing she prayed for basically boiled down to, oh God, please just kill me and get it over with. That cost me a fair amount of pain just to hear that. And the thing of it is, I know her. Like, this is not a stranger that called me on the phone one day. I know her. I know she's not a bad person. She's an emotional person in an impossibly difficult situation. She's been there for years. And she's running out of strength. Her little interior room is getting darker and darker. And at some point, she lost the ability to see God. And I don't blame her. It's not her fault. It's all the horrible people in her life that are sucking the love and the hope out of her very life. It's no wonder that her faith has collapsed as well. So that's, that's kind of what's rolling around in my head, those sorts of things, that detachment from the spirit of truth somehow. So with that in mind, you know, God does not abandon us. He doesn't. He is up there. He is waiting for us always. I promise you that. I stake my life and my very soul upon it. But we're pretty horrible brothers and sisters to one another every so often, aren't we? God does not abandon us. He does not leave us orphans. And even though we didn't hear it in the gospel today, we help each other get there. So if I could be so arrogant to add a point in that gospel reading, it would be that God does not leave anyone an orphan, but God also doesn't leave any of us an only child. We help each other get there somehow, even when all seems lost. So we're going to wrap up this, kind, this part of Mass a little bit differently than usual. I am kindly asking all of you to join me in a Hail Mary for the sake of basically everyone in your life and mine who has somehow wound up in a godless place. I had three Masses today. My first one was for the sake of their faith. The other one was for the sake of their hope. Today we're going to pray for a sake for their love. 
All right? And I know I don't need to express this out loud, but let's say it like we mean it. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Thank you for that. God bless you all.